set out to achieve two things in this video. The first one is let's look at a flow chart on how to solve any typical data sufficiency question. The second one is we'll solve three questions, right? The first objective is to basically get a template as to or an algorithm to solve any typical DS question. Follow this algorithm question after question after question. Even if you have solved a thousand DS questions, please do not overlook these steps. When you overlook these steps is when we end up getting questions incorrect, right? Let's get started. The first of these steps, it's a four step process. You, it's a three or a four step process. The first step is what is a question and what is a typical answer to the question? What do I mean by that? Let's say the question could be at what speed is John driving from point A to point B? So in a scratch paper, write down, I need to compute the speed. Also go about the second part of it. How will a typical answer to the question look like? The answer could be something like 40 mile per hour, right? right? Mile per hour. It doesn't matter what this number is. Write the unit by the side of it. So after evaluating the statements, let's say you get a unique value. You get something like John had driven 48 kilometers. You got a unique answer, but you got the answer for the distance that John had driven, not the speed at which John had driven. So writing this 48 mile per hour and getting an answer which is 48 kilometers will tell you very clearly that you do not have the answer to the question that is asked. It becomes even more critical when we have something like a B verb question. If you have a question which starts with an S, which says, is N greater than zero? Right? Is N positive the question? What is an answer to such a question? The answer is going to be an yes or a no. When is it an S? N greater than zero. That's very obvious. No issues at all. I'm going to be writing when is it a no here, right? When is it a no? The obvious one is when N is negative. When N is negative, N certainly is not positive. But sometimes we might miss out what is not so obvious. When N equals zero, in that case also, the answer is a no. Why? The question is, is n greater than zero? If n equals zero, n cannot be greater than zero. So writing when is it an s, when is it a no, helps you crack questions without wondering about. Some of us will say, n equals zero, it's neither positive nor negative. Yeah, good. But what is the question? The question is, is n greater than zero? The answer is no, if n equals zero. So having clarity in first step saves you a lot of trouble when you're looking at the statements. Step two, having got this clarity, evaluate statement one and evaluate statement one alone. Two possibilities arise. Statement one could be sufficient. If statement one is sufficient, your answer choice is one of these two, A or D. In your scratch paper, basically strike off B, C, E. If you got to this point, you have to have 50-50 chance. You cannot be marking B, C, E at a later date. If one ended up being insufficient, Strike off A and D, your answers are going to be one of these three, B, C or E. Right. Having got to one of these two branches, evaluate statement two in both these cases. You have to evaluate statement two when you got statement one sufficient because you need to decide between whether the answer is A or D. In this case, you certainly will have to evaluate statement two because one is still now not sufficient. If statement two ended up being sufficient in this branch, one is sufficient and two is also sufficient, our answer is going to be D. If two ended up being insufficient, we are in this branch where one is sufficient. One is sufficient, two is not sufficient. Your answer is going to be A. So in this question, after you evaluated statement one, you got a 50-50 chance. And after evaluating statement two, your answer is D or A. It can never be a BCE. So striking it off here saves you that trouble. If you were in this branch and two ended up being sufficient, one insufficient, two sufficient, answer choice is B. If this also ended up being insufficient, only then will we be going to checking out whether the answer is C or E. So step one, mandatory, knowing what the question is, what the answer is. Step two, mandatory, you need to evaluate statement one. Irrespective of whether statement one is sufficient or not, you'll have to evaluate statement two also and evaluate statement two independently. You'll move on to step four, to evaluate the statements together. Only when you hit this branch, if statement one is insufficient and two is also insufficient, only then should you combine the two statements. The combined value is sufficient, go with C. If it is not sufficient, go with E. Right? Keep this entire template in mind and apply it question after question. Let's get started with the three questions that I have in mind. All these three questions are inequalities number property questions. Let's get started with the first of these questions. Is 10 power n minus 7 divisible by 3? It's an yes question. Statement 1 is n is greater than 0. Statement 2 is n is an integer. 
let's get started let's do the template that we discussed in the last video again for this question alone for two and three i will let you do it i'm not going to be doing it in the video right the first question that we'll have to be asking is what is the question this is an is question is 10 power n minus 7 divisible by 3 what is the typical answer to any is question it will be either an yes or it's going to be a no when is the data sufficient this is the key if you get a definite answer if i'm able to say that yes using this statement i know that 10 power n minus 7 is divisible by 3 then the answer is the data is sufficient conversely if you are saying with this data i can be 100 percent sure that 10 power n minus 7 is not divisible by 3 then the data is sufficient data will not be sufficient if you find one case where it is divisible and another where it is not quickly i'm just going to run through this these are irrelevant in this context when is it an s when it is divisible by 3 when is it a no when it is not divisible by 3 Let's look at statement 1 alone. Statement 1 alone says n is greater than 0. n is greater than 0. Let's just check out what happens. Infinite values possible. Let me start with n equals 1. n equals 1. 10 power 1 minus 7. 10 minus 7 is a 3. The answer is yes. It's certainly divisible by 3. Check out what happens when n equals 2. n equals 2 is a 10 square minus 7. It's 100 minus 7 which is equal to 93. Test of divisibility for 3 is sum of the digits should be divisible by 3. Here the sum of the digits is divisible by 3. Answer is yes. Let's go one more. Let's look at n equals 3. 10 cube minus 7. 1000 minus 7 is a 993. Sum of the digits is divisible by 3. Answer is yes. Temptation is to conclude that when n is greater than 0, this number is divisible by 3. This expression is divisible by 3. But hold on. The question said n is greater than 0. It never said you should take only integer values. What if n happened to be a 0 0.5? 10 power 0 0.5 is under root 10 minus 7. Under root 10 minus 7 is not an integer. To be divisible by 3, the number should be an integer. So the answer ends up being no. So if n equals n is greater than 0, in some cases we have yes, and there will be quite a few cases we will be having a no. So statement 1 alone is not giving us a definite answer. If statement 1 is not giving us a definite answer, statement 1 is not sufficient. Let's rule out few choices. If 1 is not sufficient, through our template, we can quickly eliminate A and B. What are the choices left? We are left with B, C or E. Let's evaluate statement 2 alone and check whether it's B or whether it is C or E. But before that, here is one quick takeaway. Key learning is, if n is greater than 0, n can also be a non-integer. n can be numbers like 0 0.5. Do not miss out on them. Summarize it in a printed form before we move to evaluating statement 2. n greater than 0, n is equal to 1, answer is yes. n is equal to 1.5, answer is no. We don't have a definite answer. 1 alone is not sufficient. Eliminate choices A and D or choices narrow down to B, C or E. Let's evaluate statement 2 alone. n is an integer, n equals 1. Answer is yes, we have already done it. 10 power 1 minus 7 equals 3. Answer is yes. n equals 2, 3. All of those cases it works. But hold on. It says n is an integer. Integers include negative values. When n equals minus 1, we'll have a 10 power minus 1 minus 7. This is 0 0.1 minus 7, which is a minus 6.9. A negative 6.9. A number has to be an integer to be divisible by 3. This is not an integer. So this is not divisible by 3. So if n is an integer, do not forget cases where n could be negative. Statement 2 is also not giving us a unique answer, a definite yes or a no. 2 alone is not sufficient. At the end of evaluating 1, we ruled out AD. We were down to B and C, E, B or C or E. Now we realize that 2 is also not sufficient. Let's eliminate B. Here is a quick takeaway. Key learning is if n is an integer, n can be negative or n could very well be 0. Don't look at only positive integers. Summarize it and let's move on to combining the two statements. If n is an integer, could take infinite values. For n equals 1, the answer is yes. For n equals minus 1, the answer is no. No definite answer. The end of evaluating statement 1, we were down to b, c or e because 1 was not sufficient. Eliminate b because 2 is also not sufficient. We are down to c or e. To check whether it's C or E, let's combine the two statements. N is greater than 0 and N is an integer, which means N is a positive integer. We have realized that for positive integer values, 10 power N minus 7 is always divisible by 3. Statements together are sufficient. Statements together are sufficient. At the end of evaluating statement 2, we were down to C or E. Together they are sufficient. So eliminate E. Answer choice C is the correct answer.
n is positive, n is an integer. Combination is n is a positive integer. For positive integer values, 10 power n minus 7 is always divisible by 3. Together statements are sufficient. Eliminate E. Choice C is the answer. So take away in reiterating. If you realize that a number is greater than 0, it can include non-integer values. Do not ignore them. If n is an integer, it could include negative values and integers. It's a second takeaway. Key thing to note. This is an important point which I want to leave you with. Always look for exceptions in any of these scenarios. If it says n is greater than 0, look for expressions using this acronym FNZI. F stands for fractions. Will it work for fractions too? N for negative. If a number is an integer, can it be negative? Can it be 0? Finally, check to see whether it will work for integer values. Right? Always look for exceptions using F and Z, I. So, more to the second example. If N is a positive integer, is N greater than 3? Don't forget such key information given in the question stem. Right? This could make a big difference to what the answer is. Do the template, answer those 5 questions before you look into statement 1. I am going to jump to statement 1 right away. Statement 1 says N square is greater than 9. I am writing this down in your scratch paper too. Please write it down so we don't forget this key information. N square greater than 9. What's the solution? Answer is got two possibilities. N could be a number which is less than minus 3. Take a minus 4. Minus 4 square is greater than 9. Right? Minus 4 square is a 16. It's greater than 9. Or N could be greater than 3. So two possibilities exist when N square is greater than 9. Now let's plug in the information from the question sum. It says that question stem states n is a positive integer, which means it cannot take values which are less than minus 3. So what have we left with? We left with n greater than 3. Is the, what is the question? Is n greater than 3? Statement and the question term, stem together point to the fact that n is greater than 3. So we have a definite yes as an answer. Statement 1 alone is sufficient. Statement 1 alone is sufficient. Can you narrow down choices? 1 sufficient. Eliminate B, C, E. We are down to A or D. Summarize it and move on to statement 2. n square greater than 9 means n is greater than 3 or n is less than minus 3. Together with the information from the question stem that n is a positive integer, n less than minus 3 is not possible, which means n is greater than 3. We have a definite yes. Definite yes, eliminate choices B, C, E, get down to A or D. To decide whether it is A or D, let's evaluate statement 2 alone. It says root n is greater than 1.5 and we know that n is a positive integer. Square both sides will translate to n is greater than 2.25. Get conversant with finding out squares of numbers like this. 15 square is a 225, so 1.5 square is a uh, 2.25. n greater than 2.25, n is a positive integer. What all values can it take? Let's start with the smallest value that I can think of. n equals 3 is a possible value. It's a positive integer greater than 2.25. n could be a 40, n could be a 90. Infinite values are possible. If n equals 3, is it greater than 3? The answer is no. If you had written when is it an S, when is it a no in the template, you would have figured this out without batting an eyelid. n equals 3, n is not greater than 3, answer is no. If n is equal to 40, is it greater than 3? Answer is yes. So sometimes no, sometimes yes. Statement 2 alone is not sufficient. At the end of evaluating statement 1, statement 1 was sufficient. We had answer choices A or D. If 2 is not sufficient, rule out D. Our answer choice is A. Summarize it and move on. n greater than 1.5, n is a positive integer. We can infer that n, root n is greater than 1.5. We can infer that n is greater than 2.25. n is greater than 2.25 and n is a positive integer. n could be a 3. In that case, the answer is no. n could be a 4. In that case, the answer is yes. Sometimes no, sometimes yes. Actually, one's no and many a times yes. But this one case is sufficient to say that statement 2 alone is not sufficient. The end of evaluating statement 1, we were down to A or D. If 2 is not sufficient, rule out D. Choice A is the answer. Key takeaway, remember key details given in question stem. I'm going to leave you with a variant of this question. I'm going to reword the question stem. Reword the question stem to this. If n is an integer, is n greater than 3 the question? Retain the statements, solve, check out what the answer is. Then you'll realize that remembering such key details from the question stem is going to make a big difference to getting the answer right. So more to question number 3. It's a beautiful question. If p is greater than q, is p plus q an integer? We have two statements given to us. Again, go through the template, understand what the answer should be. When is the data sufficient? Is there any additional information that we have from the question stem? When is it an S? When is it a no? And then come to statement 1. Right? I'm going to jump into statement 1 right away, assuming that you have done all of that. Statement 1 says p minus q is an integer. 
my approach is going to look for a counter example what do i mean by that i'm going to look for one set of values which will keep p minus q an integer and make p plus q also an integer and a second set of value for which p minus q is an integer i cannot negate the statements and i'll find out an, an example where p plus q is not an integer then i can say hey if p minus q is an integer p plus q need not be an integer that is the way i'm going to approach this let's get started the easiest thing is to pick p and q as integers i'm going to be taking two sets of examples one right now and one in the printed right just to showcase that there exists more than one value and the key is to looking key is key in cracking such questions is your ability to look for such values right let's get started i'm going to go with a 10 and a 2 for p and q if p and q are integers p minus q is certainly an integer what is p plus q this is going to be equal to 12 keep track of the question the question is is p plus q an integer for is questions the answer should be a definite yes or a definite no for this example it is an yes i'm going to look for a counter example that will make p minus q an integer and will result in p plus q not being an integer let's see if it's possible let's say i'm picking a 10 and 1/3 and a 2 and 1/3 10 and 1/3 minus 2 and 1/3 is going to be an 8 so p minus q is an integer for this too what is p plus q that is a 12 and 2 thirds which is not an integer so with example 1 i got p minus q an integer and got p plus q also as an integer with example 2 i managed to retain p minus q an integer but p plus q ended up being a non integer so i got a counter example if i have a counter example then statement 1 is not sufficient statement 1 is not sufficient let's see what all answer choices we can rule out if one is not sufficient rule out a d we are down to b c or e summarize it and move on I'm using a different set of examples i've said if p and q are integers p plus q will be an integer no issues at all p minus q will also be an integer i'm going to give you another example just for flavor sake let p be 10 by 3 and q be 4 by 3 p minus q will be 6 by 3 which is an which is equal to 2 which is an integer p plus q is equal to a 14 by 3 which is not an integer right so you got p plus q as an integer when p and q are integers you got p plus q is not an integer in this example and in both the cases we have ended up getting p minus q as an integer counter example exists so statement one alone is not sufficient one alone is not sufficient rule out ad answers boil down to b c or e it's a valid statement to p plus 2q is an integer we're going to run through the same exercise we're going to look for a number where approaches the same counter example is my approach take p and q as integers that's the easiest one to get yes as an answer p, p and q are integers we got we can make p plus 2q an integer and we'll also get p plus q as an integer we'll keep track of the question always so it's a 10 2 i'm not going to sweat much i'm going to go with the same numbers 14 is the answer here 12 is the answer the answer is yes is p plus q an integer yes is the answer i'm going to take the same 10 and 1/3 and 2 and 1/3 let's check out what happens to p plus 2q is going to be a 10 and 1/3 2 times 2 and 1/3 is a 4 and 2/3 so 10 plus 4 is 14 1/3 plus 2/3 is another 1 so this is a 15 this continues to be an integer what is the value of p plus q this is going to be a 12 and 2/3 is it an integer no look at it in both these example sets we have managed to get p plus 2q an integer which is what the question statement number 2 is saying in one case p plus q was an integer in another p plus q is not an integer so we haven't got a unique answer so statement 2 alone is also not sufficient can we eliminate few more answer choices at the end of eliminating statement 1 we realized statement 1 was not sufficient we were down to b c or e now we realize 2 is also not sufficient let's rule out b or answer choice are down to c or e summarize before we move on to combining the statements right i'm giving you one more set of examples if p and q are integers p plus 2q will be an integer and p plus q will also be an integer let's not even bother about it going with 10 by 3 and 4 by 3 10 by 3 plus 2 times 4 by 3 is an 8 by 3 18 by 3 is equal to a 6 so p plus 2q is an integer for this set of values p plus q is going to be a 14 by 3 the answer is no for this so given another set of counter example to prove that if you are sharp if you are watching out for instances you will be able to figure out such counter examples statement 2 alone is not sufficient statement 2 alone is not sufficient at the end of evaluating one or answer choice were down to b c or e eliminate b we are down to c or e so combine the two statements 
p minus q is an integer p plus 2q is an integer again counter example is the process to decide between c or e right i'm going to go with p q p minus q p plus 2q p plus q and the question take both of these as integers 10 and 8 right we went or 10 and 2 we'll go with this 10 and 2 p minus q is going to be an 8 p plus 2q is going to be equal to a 14 p plus 2q is a 12 so the answer is yes so for this example if p and q are integers everything is going to be an integer p minus q is an integer p plus 2q is an integer p plus q is an integer now what happens if this is a 10 and 1 third and this is a 2 and 1 third p minus q will be an 8 because the 1 third 1 third gets cancelled 10 minus 2 is an 8 we realize this is going to be equal to a 15 because 10 and 1 third and 4 and 2 thirds will be a 15 so I made these two as integers this is going to be equal to a 12 and 2 third which is not an integer so we got a counter example maintaining both these as integers and in one instance p plus q was an integer and another p plus q was not an integer so despite combining the two statements we have not been able to come up with the conclusive answers statements together are not sufficient we ended up with a c or a e c is not the answer e is the answer let's summarize and wind up when p and q are integers all of these are going to be integers p minus q will be an integer p plus 2 q will be an integer p plus q will be an integer answer is yes for flavor sake we have a second example 10 by 3 and 4 by 3 10 by 3 minus 4 by 3 is going to be a 2 this is an integer 10 by 3 plus 2 times 4 by 3 is a 6 that's also an integer 10 by 3 plus 4 by 3 p plus q is a 14 by 3 the answer is no so despite combining we don't have a unique answer we don't have a definite yes or a definite no we have sometimes yes sometimes no rule out c answer choice e is the correct answer right quickly what is the key takeaway from this the key takeaway is your ability to find out a counter example so look for counter example always keep this in mind f and z i is going to be your acronym to find out these counter examples right the other thing is if you could not do this there is also an algebraic way of going about the same thing that's going to be a little more cumbersome little more time consuming right having done this sign up as a trial user and try the gmat online course offered by visaco the url to visit is gmat.visaco.com right everything is covered in detail it's a very comprehensive course check it out today and subscribe to this channel to get updates on gmat prep best wishes